It's Thursday, the 30th of November. This is Photo Walkthrough, show number 43, Tutorial 11, Chapter 3. And on today's show, we're going to start with a quick promo from Tips from the Top Floor. Then we're going to cover negative space in our composition segments. And then we'll finish up with converting our wheelbarrow image to the high contrast, low color version using the LAB color space that we started on last week. The days grow shorter, the weather gets colder, and our hearts are once more filled with warmth. And again, as every year, thousands and thousands of digital cameras will find their way under the Christmas trees. But many of those little cameras are very, very sad because they will only be used for the simplest of snapshots, even though they are capable of doing so much more. In order to change that... Wait, 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 hold on a second, hold, stop it. Can, can't you see, I just don't have the time to record any promos right now. I mean, just listen, I'm working hard on getting this advent calendar done for the listeners and it has to be finished by December the 1st. Now, look, I've got 24 doors to fill with content. Let me show you. Come on, open up. <sighs> See, it's a tough job. Okay, now, please excuse me, I've got more work to do here. 24 tips for your digital photography starting December 1st at tipsfromthetopfloor.com. The podcast about all things digital photography. Thanks for that, Chris. What a wonderful idea. 24 mini shows for the 24 days leading up to Christmas. I think it's a fantastic idea and I'll definitely be listening to those. Okay, let's take on today's composition subject. As usual, I've taken photos that demonstrate today's composition technique from the photo walkthrough group on Flickr. So I'd like to say a big thank you to C2 Photo, Rigidius, SJ Prokes, Lizinia, Orbit Yellow, Jason Hightower, and Nanaki for posting your pictures to the group, and I hope you don't mind me showing them off here. So to start with, what is negative space? Well, put simply, it's the parts of your photograph that aren't the subject. So in this picture, for example, the subject, or positive space, is obvious. It's the stalks here that I've highlighted. If I highlight the positive space in white, then the negative space is this portion of the image that's in black. And it's important to note that as well as being bound by the edges of the subject, the negative space is also bound by the frame of the picture. You'll all probably be familiar with this usage of negative space. In this case, the balance of the photograph is tipped away from the subject in favor of more negative space. This is an effective technique for conveying solitude, separation, or loneliness. And it can also convey strength against adversity or contrast. But negative space can also be used in other ways as well. Like here, for example, where it's used to create a sense of movement. The balance of positive and negative space affects the mood of the shot. And if a lot of negative space can create a sense of solitude, so a very small amount of negative space can create a sense of intimacy. Or in some cases, it can even feel threatening or uncomfortable, as though we're invading the personal space of our subject. Often you'll see a movie director use camera angles that are very close to the hero's face to intentionally reduce the negative space between the subject and the edge of the shot, the frame. Tarantino does this quite a bit in Kill Bill, and it creates a very tense feeling. You don't feel like you can see what's coming. It's as though a greater amount of negative space around the subject makes you feel more safe and gives you more time to react. The real difficulty with some photographs can be deciding which parts of the shot are negative space and which parts are positive space. A part of a photo can be made into the subject by a number of methods, but typically we use the subject's position in the shot, lightness and darkness values, focus, color saturation, and often connectedness. By connectedness, I mean when elements of the shot overlap each other or butt up against each other, seemingly touching. So if something in the photograph is touching something that's clearly the subject, then it too can become part of the subject. This is partly how trees and lampposts growing out of people's heads in snapshots can so easily become part of the shot. So it's assignment time. This week I'd like you to go out and take a photo that uses negative space. Once again, though, this week I'm going to introduce a special rule for this assignment. This week you can take as many shots as you like, but the one shot you choose at the end must not be cropped in any way. 
You can do as much post-processing on it as you like, but no cropping. I want you to see the positive and negative space when you're looking through your viewfinder, and I want you to be especially aware of the edges of your shot. One way to go about this assignment is to think about your shots in the same way that you did for the Reduce and Simplify assignment. If you can find shots where you can readily identify your subject and your background, then you can start thinking about those as positive and negative space. And don't be afraid to let your subject touch the edge of your shot either, or even go right outside it. So that's this week's assignment. Shoot a shot that makes use of negative space without cropping, and post it to the PW underscore assignments group on Flickr. As usual, I'll show the assignment entries at the end of the next show, and at the end of this week's show, I've got a great crop of entries for last week's assignment on repetition. So, actually what I'm going to be doing here, um, you've already seen me do uh, a contrast improvement on that lightness channel. So I'm actually going to just do all this without layers. I'm just going to do the same things that, that I will be doing next week in layers, but I'm just going to do them with just image adjustments. So in the image menu, adjustments, levels, and I'm going to do what I did a moment ago. I'm going to, hang on, let's just look at the lightness channel. Let's turn off the A and B channels. So we're just seeing lightness, image, adjust, levels, and I'm going to darken it down a bit and I'm going to pull the ends in. Now that, that's my black point slider. What I'm saying is everything everything below this value that I'm sliding up and down is going to be solid black. And as I drag that up, you can see it's darkening the image. Of course it is, because what it's doing is it's saying this value down here at the very bottom, that's 255. If I drag it up, it's 250, 245, 230, and so on and so forth. And I'm actually chopping off values below that. And as you can see on the histogram, there really is data down there. So I really am throwing data away by dragging this in. This is one of the reasons why curves is usually a better way to go than the levels dialog, because with curves, you can actually, um, well, let's just let's do it. Let's go into the curves. That's Control M for curves. And I can achieve the same thing to increase contrast by doing an S curve. And in this case, I don't want to go too much brighter, but I do want to darken. And what I'm doing now, instead of just chopping values off, I can chop values off by doing that. But instead, what I do is I do a downward curve, and I actually just darken them. So a, a value that was, say, 230 might darken down to, say, 245, but it's not blocking straight out to 255. So you can actually keep some shadow detail down there by doing it with the curves. But in this case, I'm going to go with the levels, just because I don't actually mind losing a bit of shadow detail down there. It wasn't detail that was really adding much to the image, so I'm just going to let it get, let it be. Um, just going to drag the white point down just to uh, because there's some empty space at the top of the histogram there with no information in it. So I'll drag that down. That lets me brighten up the lighter portions. And this is my midpoint slider now. And that's saying, well, I want I want my information centered around this point here. And really, this is just like a brightening or darkening tool. So uh, just going to drag that to where it looks reasonably good. It can be a little bit more aggressive on the black there. Remember, this is the lightness values we're working with, not the color values. So this is only a portion of our data. But if I press OK on that and go back to our LAB mode, already we can see that that's a much more moody shot than it was. The next thing I'm going to do is I am going to um, reduce the color information. Um, if you look down here, I'm trying to find a way of explaining what I mean. Um, we've got a sort of a, a browny gray ground with some nicely defined plants on it here. I mean, there's the weeds, but, but the point is that the color is all nicely within the edges of the leaves, as it should be. What I'm going to do, just to give this a bit of grain and grit, and actually also to reduce the color a little, is I'm going to blur the A and B channels. So let's turn off, uh, let's, turn, let's just look at our A channel. And then I'm going to go to Filter, Blur, Gaussian blur, and where's my Gaussian blur? There it is. Um, now it's going to be really hard to see this, but I'm going to let it blur quite a lot. Let's let's go up to I don't know. Let's let's go up to sort of eight or something like that, and that will blur the A channel. And then let's do the same thing again. 
and because I've just done it at the top of my filters panel the Gaussian blur I can just hit that button again and it will do the same thing with the same settings now let's have a look at how that looks now let's just look at our history palette a nice way of seeing how, how much this affected the image is to jump back and forth between how it looked before the, those, those two changes and how it looked after so in our history palette I'm going to go back and click on the step just before the two Gaussian blurs and the step just after now that's not made a huge difference it's a little bit hard to see but if you look closely you'll see the edges of the, those leaves starting to go a little bit brown just like the ground around them so when I click here on levels like now it sharpens it all up the edges of the, the leaves are green and the, the ground is grey if I click on the Gaussian blur it's blurring the colors it's keeping the same brightness data so we've still got the same um, uh, detail information but the color information is getting less clear so I haven't blurred enough there so let's try that again so I'm going to go back to that levels I'm going to go back to my channels and I'm going to just look at my A channel and I'm going to go filter blur Gaussian blur and this time let's, let's go let's go crazy let's go up to 20 20.5 is close enough and then filter Gaussian blur again and then this time let's look at everything and I can already see that's looking much more the kind of way I wanted it let's go to our history palette let's zoom in on some of that detail again and if you look now what we're seeing here is we're just seeing a sort of a, a, a concentration of green roughly on the plant but if you look at the edge of the leaves here they're the same colour as the ground, they're the same colour as the ground what we're doing, this is, this is almost just a suggestion of colour um, and what we're doing is turning our image into just regions of colour so this edge of the wheel, we, where we've got the edge of the wheel it is still the right colour and this is still blue here but if you look here along this edge you can see that the blue sort of stops being blue before it gets to the edge there so this is just mushing out the colours and just simplifying the colour in the image just trying to see places where you can see it more clearly um, let me just turn this on and off let's zoom in somewhere where you can see the detail and then turn these changes on and off yeah so you can see it quite clearly there so look the colour along that edge of that that metal rim on the on the wooden wheel there we've got um, the wooden bit is clearly blue the metal bit is clearly sort of rust brown if I go down to the afterwards the after the blurs you can see if I turn it off and on and off and on the blue just sort of dims down a little bit the orange dims down a little bit and they just sort of blur into one another quite quite gently so that's the effect I was going for there now the final step here is just to do um, a sharpen and once again we're going to uh, use the lightness values because we're not interested in sharpening the colour we just want to do a sharpening on the lightness values so I'm going to do sharpen unsharp mask and that pops up the unsharp mask window which if I just find some detail here's some detail this is a good example of a place where I want the um, detail sharpened um, now typically the way I do a sharpen with the unsharp mask is I would drag the, the amount up way up to sort of 300 something like that and then drag the radius up to the point where it looks pretty awful um, and then I'm going to drag it down until you're starting to you see what happens if I drag this radius right up you get lines and you clear halos along the edges of things you want to drag the, the radius down until those halos stop basically so I can still see a halo just under there and I usually find that this radius is somewhere down between about 0.5 and 1 um, I'm intentionally going to make this a fairly strong sharpness because what I'm going for is a gritty image um, so I'm going to drag that radius up so that it's still looking a bit liney but now that I've done that oh, and this should all be done with a threshold at 0 by the way I had it at 3 by accident um, Good. So I'm intentionally leaving the radius higher there, um, just yeah, about there-ish. 
um, and then you can drag the amount down until it looks good and you'll find it usually looks good somewhere between 100 and 200 so let's let's go for 150 and see how that looks so if I press OK on that once again back to my history palette oh let's look at the whole image in its final version if I go back to my history palette I can go back and forth and I can see that that's adding quite a lot of sharpening on the front of the um, uh, on the front of the wheel there um, that's pretty close to the sort of effect I was after I'm not sure I've sharpened it enough actually let's undo that let's go back to channels and once again with just the lightness filter sharpen unsharp mask and let's drag that radius right up I'm going to just look at this version now because I'm I'm going to be brave and I'm going to show you how to back some of this off. So let's go radius 5 and let's drag our amount up to 180 odd. Now that's that's looking more the kind of texture I wanted here. It's looking fairly rotten down here though so what I'm going to do in our history window again I'm going to set a, a, a history point. I'm going, to, I'm going to undo this last step and I'm going to set a history point on the sharpened version. So this column here, just to the left of all the steps in the history palette, this is the, the set source for history brush column. Um, and that's saying when I paint with a history brush, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get information from that history step. And I'm going to be painting that. So if I make myself a, a brush, what I'm interested in doing is bringing in detail there and there. Um, so what I'm going to do now is with my history brush set um, I've got I want to uh, yeah that's working pretty well I'm just with the mouse today actually I'm not using a, a graphics tablet at the moment so let's drag the opacity down to 25 and we can as we always do layer this in and this allows me to paint the changes I want a little at a time 25% at a time and just sharpen up those places where I want the eye to be drawn because the sharpness is adding contrast to the image where, where we're sharpening and that's going to draw the eye so that's what I'm after there and I think that's, that's going in the right kind of direction now a little bit more there that's looking good ok could carry on with that but I'm conscious of time I'm probably running a bit long today because I'm doing the whole image all in one show um, final step I think is going to be just to do a little dodging and burning and a little desaturation so uh, once again I'm not using any layers today I'm going to do all the layers next week um, I'm just showing you how I could do all these things without uh, without the layers so you don't normally see me use this this is the dodge and burn tool and it's just there underneath the gradient tool um, let's just do a little burning once again I'm with the mouse not with the graphics tablet so I'm going to drag the exposure down and you can see here we can dodge or burn based on shadows, midtones or highlights which means that the the dodging and burning will only work on either the dimmest parts or the middle tone parts or the high or brightest parts of the image in this case I'm guessing that these bits here which is where I'm going to burn are sort of mid-tony so um, I'm just going to get my brush to about the size of the edit I want to do and let's drag the exposure down once again to 20% this time just that ought to be about right, yes that's about right and I'm just, as you can see, I'm just darkening up the shadows the spokes are casting and then let's do the same thing if I click and hold on that burn tool I get the dodge tool once again, let's get the brush to about the size of the edit I want to make set the exposure to about 20% and this time, uh, let's stick with mid-tones these are all fairly mid-tony, these areas that I'm working on just lighten up the 
the light areas between the spokes. And I just wanted to emphasize the light coming through those spokes there. And I think the final step on today's image is going to be just to desaturate just a little bit. So image adjustments, hue saturation, and then just dragging the saturation slider down just a shade. Actually, let's not do that. Let's let's just desaturate the greens and yellows a bit. These these green plants on the ground here, you'll probably find they're actually more yellow than green. If I click the uh, while we've got green selected in the hue saturation, if I click on the green there, it'll center the color slider along the bottom on that color. And as you can see, it moved a lot more to the left there. It is it's it's still green, but there's a lot of yellow in it. And those are the main things that are distracting me on this image now. So I'm just going to drag the saturation down on that green because I don't want it drawing the eye as much as it is. So I've dragged that down quite a bit. And then I'm going to grab the... Let's go for reds. Um, this is probably more red than anything else. If I click the eyedropper inside the bucket there, I'm just going to push the saturation on that one down a little bit less. Let's just, yeah, I think it's actually pretty good somewhere in the middle. I'm just going to take it down just a tiny little bit. And I'm going to press OK on that. And that is pretty much our image done. It doesn't look exactly the same as the one, the one that we're creating, but uh, you can see the techniques that are used to do the sort of things that we're going to cover next week in layers. But this was all done with LAB color mode and with channels and with uh, the image adjustments done through the image adjustments menu rather than adjustment layers. So I hope that was interesting, something a little bit different. Um, certainly you'll never see me use the dodge and burn tools before um, and unlikely to see me use them again for dodging and burning at least. Um, but I thought that might be interesting and next week I'll show you how to do it even better. Thanks for watching, I will catch you next week. Photo Walkthrough is a weekly video podcast. You can subscribe through iTunes or by visiting www.photowalkthrough.com. Subscription is free and new shows will be automatically downloaded as soon as they're released. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show, email photowalkthrough at gmail.com or leave a comment using the audio comments box on our homepage.
photocastnetwork.com your photography resource in the potosphere photocastnetwork.com